Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to our panel on cultural exchanges. Um, uh, this will be a, a somewhat different format than we had in the earlier discussions. Uh, a little more informal, uh, what I'll ask people to do first is first introduce themselves uh, and to talk perhaps a line or two about their first cultural shock when they crossed the Atlantic. Uh, then uh, we'll have a more open discussion about some of the issues that are affected by culture on both sides uh, of the Atlantic. So uh, I'm Harvey Feigenbaum. I'm a professor at George Washington University. Uh, I guess I will ask, uh, it, just go in the, in the order that we are sitting, to ask each member to introduce herself or himself uh, and briefly tell us your sort of first reaction to culture on the other side of the Atlantic. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Anne-Cécile Robert. I'm a, I'm a journalist and I'm director of international relations for Le Monde Diplomatique. It's a French monthly. And we have 40 uh, international editions around the world and we are published in 26 languages. And I'm also a, a, a teacher at Paris 8 University and uh, I have a PhD in European law. And uh, I teach European affairs and, and politics uh, at Paris 8 University. Uh, I'm Lorenzo Morris, and I'm a professor of political science at Howard University here in Washington. And I just realized, well, I was a visiting professor at Paris 8 at, in, uh, quite a few years ago. I guess for the first, uh, what is it, international shock, that's the question you asked. So long ago, it seems a bit antediluvian, but I remember going to Paris uh, looking for food, basically, because I'd heard so much about French food and being shocked by the cultural diversity and of Paris. And uh, for an American in the 1970s, I was a child prodigy, um, the shock of being identified as an American was more than I had been prepared for. I just never thought of myself in the very American way. So that the European diversity that I saw in Paris along with the Americanization of myself was probably the biggest thing for me. Hello, I'm uh, Kimberly Morgan. I'm a professor of political science and international affairs at George Washington University, so just down the road from here. And my research focuses on the politics of uh, the welfare state in part. That's what a lot of my research has been about studying the welfare state in uh, Western European countries and also the United States. And these days I've been working more on immigration uh, policy and politics, very timely, of course, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. It's hard for me also to remember <laughs> the first culture shock. There were so many when I arrived in uh, Brussels in uh, 1987, uh, the first time that I'd been uh, in, in Western Europe and living in Europe for some time. And uh, I think the thing that really struck me first and foremost, actually, was the well-functioning transportation system. <laughs> the, the, uh, the wonders of public transportation, which uh, were so unfamiliar to me. Um, but from that, I think, honestly, I started to just grow interested in uh, collective public provision. The idea of doing things uh, using taxpayer resources to support public collective goals. Uh, and I think that ultimately is what brought me to my interest in studying the welfare state. And I think it really started from some of those first observations I had when I arrived uh, in Brussels and could just climb on a tram and go wherever I liked. Hi, and you've seen me over on the, the other side of the room, but my name is James Barber, and one of the many hats I wear is as cultural counselor here at the, the EU delegation. Um, we view cultural diplomacy and public diplomacy as absolutely essential in terms of um, carrying out the EU's mission here in the US and making, making friends and hopefully influencing people through, through the power of cultural relations. Um, Harvey, you asked about culture shock. I mean, as a, as a diplomat, you experience that on a very regular basis every time you rotate. And for me, whether it was my, my first ever posting, which was to Africa, and suddenly finding myself as quite a young diplomat representing a, a former colonial power and all the baggage that goes with that, or you know, fast forward 20 years and, and coming here and realizing that Actually, in cultural terms, familiarity probably breeds contempt and that this is much more of a foreign country for us Europeans than we think it is. And the longer you spend here as a European, the more you realize that there are those, those differences, but those differences also provide us with the opportunities to, to engage. Well, um, I, I realize that I forgot to mention my own first culture shock, so I should say that uh, when I was a, a student at Sciences Po, uh, I'm a native Washingtonian, uh, one of those rare people, uh, and uh, and one of the um, French students next to me who had been to Washington and said it was very nice, but he said, how can you stand the summers? 
And I looked at him quizzically, because I did not know that other people don't have summers like they do in Washington, which is um, intensely humid and miserable. I simply assumed that's what summer is. Uh, so my shock was basically had to do more about temperature and humidity than, uh, than, than culture. I, I realize I didn't uh, speak about my first cultural shock when I came here for the first time in the 1970s. And it was the way uh, people here speak about money so easily, how much do you make? And it's all, all about money in Europe and in France especially, you don't speak about money that easily. So that was very strange. And, and when uh, I went to Africa afterwards for my, my job, it was... Uh, more and more surprising the way that they don't speak about material things at all. So that's, you know, in, in, in the US you speak about money, in, in, the U, in Europe you don't, you, it, you're not at ease with money, and in Africa you don't speak about material things at all, you speak about feelings, about what you, you feel about people and things, it's very different. I was going to ask if you mainly talk about philosophy in Africa, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Um, basically, to sort of uh, begin our discussion, I'd like to start with current events that have been um, affecting all of us. And uh, we, of course, had the uh, not only the recent uh, vote for Brexit in Britain in the summer, the election of Donald Trump in, uh, in the United States, uh, a lot of talk about a kind of wave of populism going on uh, on both sides of the, uh, the Atlantic. In Koblenz over the weekend, there were um, uh, discussions by, from as the different far-right parties of Europe uh, are exploring ways in which they can ally. Uh, so I'd like to, since this is supposed to be a, a panel discussion about culture, I'd like to ask the panelists their thoughts about whether there's a cultural angle to this, um, uh, this uh, new wave of populism that we're experiencing. So if, if someone has some ideas on that, I'd, I'd ask them to simply say so. Well, I yeah. suppose since I do American politics when I'm not in France, I should say something about it. I'm certainly fascinated by the coincidence of movements around the world. I was mentioning earlier, I have a student who just returned from Austria, uh, and she told me that she thought the Austrian elections, which confronted a right-wing and versus a conservative versus al other alternatives, was influenced by a shocked reaction to the American election and the success of Donald Trump, meaning that populist Move, the populists were less successful than they might otherwise have been because of a reaction to a populist party. But I think that there's a long American history of searching around populist movements which come in, in waves, and it is striking that they are all coming together because I think that there are economic cycles that stimulate them, and we're seeing economic cycles now, along with, I think, the globalization phenomenon, not as a political target, but simply as what I call agoraphobia. The fear of finding your identity in an open space that fits with my image of the American cowboy, looking to build things and put fences around. I thought when you were talking about agoraphobia, it was a reference to a fear of Al Gore. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, but, oh, no, so, no I'm, go ahead. Uh, so anyway, we do have, uh, as social scientists, we see similar events, and, and so the first kind of thing you try and think about is are there similar causes? And, and, uh, and I certainly give you all license to go beyond culture in, in exploring that, but I, I'd like to know if you have thoughts about how we might, is it, is it all, if, if it's a reaction to globalization, why now? Uh, that uh, uh, we've had globalization for a long time. If it's uh, a reaction to something else, I'm curious to know what those other things might be. So I'm, I'm curious to know what, what people on the panel think. These are big questions, Harvey. <laughs> that we're My bread be, and butter. I know, yeah, that we're gonna, going to be wrestling with for a long time, I think. Um, well, I wanted to go back to the earlier question more about culture and if there's a cultural dimension, because I, I do think when I look at the European debates about um, immigration, for instance, which I think have been so much behind the populist backlash um, in, and mobilization there, I do think there's been an important cultural component of those debates in the sense that the understanding of immigration, immigrant integration, uh, the, the immigrant problem, or however you want to describe it, increasingly came to be viewed 
think starting around the 1990s or so in terms of uh, kind of a cultural clash, instead of viewing integration as an issue of, uh, let's say, integration into good jobs, uh, social integration, economic integration. Increasingly, I think the debates became about culture and whether or not groups could culturally integrate. And thus the focus on uh, things like the, the headscarf or the kind of food that people can or cannot eat, uh, the burqa and the burqa bans, um, all these end up being questions of culture that come to the forefront. Um, and it's somewhat interesting actually that those become so much so salient when in fact what seems to be behind a lot of the po populist movement, which they're, you know, I think exploiting these cultural questions, but really at the roots of the populist movement, I would argue are much more economic questions that what we see across the Atlantic is our similar set of trends in the hollowing out of the manufacturing economy, the declining job opportunities for people in certain segments of the economy, and thus their fears and frustrations have actually been acted out through a, a language of uh, cultural nationalism. And so it's really this kind of link then between the large scale economic structures and these, uh, the cultural language in which, in which that's been expressed that has been fascinating to watch on both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah. Well, I've been here for three days and I've been watching TV a, a little and it's amazing to, to watch CBS, uh, ABC and then Fox News. <laughs> it seems that we have, we are living two different worlds and those worlds are just at the same time at the same place, and that's what uh, is uh, really um, worrying, uh, because we are we uh, able to to build a common culture, uh, or are we starting to have two cultures developing at the same time? And I, I was um, uh, walking uh, near the White House the other day, and there was this woman. She she had voted Trump, and she was explaining why. And there was a, a woman. She had uh, marched for uh, uh, women's rights, and they were trying to talk, but they couldn't talk because they, they were not living in the same world. And that's that's really uh, uh, worrying. And in Europe, it's the same thing. In France, it's the same thing. And maybe. Uh, a culture could do something about that because uh, about movies, TV shows, there are not many TV shows and movies about average people, poor people. And, and maybe those poor people today feel they are not represented. Nobody listens to them. Nobody understands them. And so we are developing two different societies that, not, that are not communicating. I just wanted to echo that because you, you've made a lot of the points that I was um, that were on my mind so much. We, as as cultural diplomats, we we try and project our own identities to our audiences through through culture. But very often we don't we we lack the kind of the introspection to to look at our own societies and make exactly the distinctions that you've just made. That we're talking past each other so much of the time, and whether it's in the food that different sectors of society eat, or the music they listen to, or the TV shows they watch, or the theatre, if you don't look within your own society, look within your country, and spot those cultural divisions as they evolve, then you're setting, themselves up, setting yourselves up for exactly the kind of um, divided societies that I think we risk on, on both sides of the Atlantic. But I, I don't want to end on, on a negative note in this particular intervention, because I think there are many positive things that you can take from that. I used to do, when I was posted in Africa, an awful lot of work with the British Council, who would take bits of British culture and showcase it around the world. And they would deliberately look for graffiti artists from inner cities, hip-hop artists from the north of England. It wasn't all about Shakespeare. It wasn't all about classical music and Bach and Benjamin Britten and whoever else. It was about taking as much of a diverse cross-section of British culture as was possibly available. And if we do that, then I think we can solve this. If we do that, then I think the, the cultural divisions that we're seeing can be you know, not necessarily narrowed because diversity of culture is a good thing, but they can be understood. Um, it, it strikes me that um, when you look at the, the divisions that uh, Anne Cecile was talking about and, and uh, James has confirmed, uh, and, and some of the discussions that Kim Kimberly was making, one of the key divisions, it seems to me, that we find in all of our societies, although not always to the same extent, is a kind of division between urban and rural people that, uh, that often you find a lot of the support for populism is strongest in rural areas, uh, a lot of the xenophobia 
uh, uh, that you find is stronger uh, in, in rural areas, whether you're talking about uh, the United States or you're talking about, if you're looking at uh, fraction elections, uh, that you see a kind of fairly sharp division between urban and rural. So I'm, I'm wondering is that, is the culture divisions that we're seeing not only the people who feel left out of uh, globalization, but also to some extent building on uh, a cultural divide that has been going on for really a very long time. I'm curious to know if anyone has any thoughts about that. Uh, uh, Lorenzo? <laughs> I have thoughts, but they aren't necessarily coherent. I think that globalization is a part of the segmentation of geographically in the sense of society. People feel their absence from the international wealth, forget international community, international wealth, and from the businesses. If you look at the smallest of companies that is people afraid of sending jobs elsewhere or doing other things, they see the connections as externally. I grew up in a town where there was a very large international business, IBM. And when I grew up in the little town where IBM started, walking distance from Roosevelt's home, funded by its initiatives in the war, World War II, in creating that new idea called computers, they had, they brought in people from different parts of the world to work in there, in different parts of the world, the U.S. meaning the few blacks that came from the South and elsewhere. And one of the things was that IBM was the town company. My father sang in the IBM Country Club, and that was the only place we could socialize outside of our church group, the IBM Country Club. Much of rural society clings to those elements of business and community, whether industrial or others, that helps to define them. I think maybe in parts of France you see some smaller towns that are not rural, that are drawn in by the same connection, so that when you have a disturbance, immigrants or others, coming into a space that has already been emptied from the what you might call the business elite. It makes for more than just a cultural connection, it makes for a link to that rural isolation from global wealth, and it makes for a link to the loss of part of an unstated identity that Americans, Americans don't have the same touchable, tangible exclamation of who I am as an identity. So for us, I think we weren't expecting a popular surge, but it was more logical because of that identity and security. I'm curious to know, uh, and, I, and, and Kimberly mentioned this uh, a little earlier, that um, part of what's generating a lot of tension right now is sort of the sudden increase in immigration, uh, either forced by uh, circumstances of, say, the Syrian war, which uh, leads to a lot of refugees, uh, but before that there certainly have been waves of immigration uh, in Europe. And it strikes me that one of the big differences between the United States and Europe is our outlook towards immigration, that uh, Americans subscribe to a myth that we are a country, not a myth, it's truth, that we're a country of immigrants, that we all think of ourselves as, um, uh, as being descended from immigrants, uh, and we think of America as being defined and its identity in some way as a nation of immigrants. This is really quite different from, uh, it seems to me, the experience that's going on in Europe. And I'm, I'm curious to know what the panel might think about, uh, either, either from their own experiences or from their understanding of what's going on on both sides of the Atlantic, what kinds of differences there are in, in understanding the immigrant experience. Kimberly? Yeah, so I actually would uh, say that the differences are not as pronounced as they're often said to be. I do agree that there are these understandings, and I hear it all the time. I hear it with my own students uh, when I try to teach them about immigration politics in the U.S. and, and, and Europe. They kind of latch on to the idea that, well, we here in the U.S., we're so comfortable with diversity and immigration. Um, we're much more flexible, and uh, as a culture, we can incorporate new, new groups into our, into our national culture. Um, but I think the, you know, the, what we've seen, uh, certainly with the, the Trump victory, but already with the Tea Party and the really quite longstanding now uh, mobilization against immigration in the U.S. for several decades it's been going on, uh, that maybe we're not as open as we like to think that we are. Um, and so Trump maybe came as a surprise to some who were perhaps a little bit complacent about our ability to manage uh, our diverse society and the kinds of tensions that follow from that. But I would say the same thing looking across the Atlantic, that I think sometimes uh, I hear people in, in, in Europe um, sort of say that the U.S. model for dealing with immigration or diversity doesn't have anything to offer because, hey, we're not countries of immigration. So, you know, we, we just have a different cultural approach to this. And I would say that a lot of European countries have been countries of immigration for a long time now. Uh, and and repeating the mantra that uh, we are not a country of immigration doesn't make it so. Um, and that actually there's, there probably are more lessons that could be learned uh, looking across the pond at each other. 
my my own country certainly is a country of immigration, dating back to, to 1066 for the French people in the room. Um, but, you know, there's a serious point, which is that successful migration is absolutely contingent on cultural understanding. Because if you bring different groups of people together, different groups of societies, different civilizations together, and they don't understand each other's culture, whether it's dress or food or customs or whatever else, then you are going to have tensions. And I know it's very fashionable at the moment to, to bash the media, but I think the media have a tremendous role and tremendous responsibility here. There's this paradox that Europeans laugh about of um, Schrodinger's immigrant, you know, the, the person that's coming to our country and at the same time is claiming our benefits and taking our state subsidized housing, they're also taking our jobs, and you can't do both. Um, but the, this kind of media kind of concept of immigrants as being something bad, something negative, something that is detracting from the existing society would be so easy to reverse if the same power of the media could be harnessed to educate, to explain the, the, kind of the, the benefits of cultural di diversity, to explain what people are bringing to a country in terms of food, in terms of customs, in terms of breadth of diversity. So I, as I say, it's, it's fashionable to bash the media at the moment. I don't want to do it too much. But I think there is a responsibility both for media outlets themselves, but also for those who speak to the broader society through the media to get their, their messaging right, because fear-mongering is very dangerous. Are people getting the same message on the media in Europe that they are in the United States? Can you, are the media cul uh, culprits in both, both sides of the Atlantic? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking primarily of the, the tabloid press in certain European countries when I say this. Lorenzo. Well, I think that one of the things missing from the comparison, and I think the issues are similar across lines, is the, econ the economic nature of the politics of immigration. That while it's economic in both sides of the uh, Atlantic, I think it's, it was uniquely economic in the American sense, in the sense that there was less of a cultural, clear cultural identity to be protected. But more importantly, this anti-immigration politics goes back to the 1980s which is exactly the end of the effect of what we call the Great Migration, the movement of African Americans into the cities. And that tended to mix with and suppress, and I can go through various periods of discussing this, but suppress anti-immigration attitudes because there was always a bigger issue for party politics to confront. Once that, those issues are aside, then you get to a position where non economic development becomes, along with immigration, then a threat to our primary reason for immigration, which is to support. Job. So all of a sudden, immigrants are here, and people don't see them in the quite the same positive economic perspective. As uh, is the treatment of mus Muslims analogous to the treatment of blacks in the United States? Do they say, play the same kind of role in uh, in, in, in in politics? I'm, I'm following up on you, but then but uh, then no, ask open I, others. I, I, with, on the question of in France uh, and their early economic arrival would be a problematic because early tribal arrival where where they went into jobs in France, et cetera, was still covered by this post-colonial link in the whole citizenship issues and their lack of desire to remain French, at, a lot, at least in the initial phrases. They wanted to have the resources but not to necessarily take citizenship in France when it wasn't offered. I think in the, U, the U.S., the analogy, the analogy is different because the French had some idea, even if they didn't talk about it, of, of identity that was cultural and extensive and religious or, or like, but of something. And the Europeans, are, the new Europeans, had uh, characteristics of religiosity, as we call it, and didn't fit culturally. Whereas Americans, not to be critical of ourselves, we don't have all of those clarities about identity. And the only clarity we had was a relationship that was racial, and so it was destabilizing. Uh, I, I, let me just interject an anecdote uh, that um, I was a student in France. Uh, one of my best friends when I was a student at Sciences Po was uh, a guy, uh, a, a Parisian of Armenian extraction. Uh, and he was absolutely tortured because he couldn't decide if he was Armenian or if he was French. The notion that he could be both uh, just did not occur to him. It, and, it, it, and, and I think this is, it, to some extent, part of the, the differences in identity politics that we find in, in, in Europe as opposed to, to the US. In the US, we're very comfortable with multiple identities, uh, uh, sometimes multiple policy preferences. Uh, and uh, that, uh, whereas in Europe, this is not something that they seem to be especially familiar with. Is that the experience of, of others on the panel as well? Yeah, I would like to say a few words about France because you mentioned <laughs> my, my country. In the 1980s, the government came up with a, a slogan, a motto that was, let's leave our differences together. 
meaning we can be different, but we can live together. But at the same time, the government was promoting public education, uh, movies for children to bring people together. So that, and they, they were saying that, well, let's leave our differences together, but the national culture is what brings us to, together. But this balance is now broken, and especially because of uh, economic problems, unemployment, the question of differences is seen as a threat to, to many people because you, you, you believe that the, the somebody who's coming from another country is going to take your job. So you, you, don't, you don't care about his, his identity, you just want to, to keep yours and your job. So it's, uh, it's, it's not a very good time to, uh, to speak about uh, being uh, peacefully uh, together. But uh, um, um, this, the situation is new for France. Because um, I mean, um, uh, for for example, <laughs> um, we've never had the same racial problems as there are in this country. Uh, for example, it's always been a tradition for French people to mingle with black people, even in the colonies. We've never had that problem, and I know that in this country, uh, a white man marrying a black woman ca can be an, is an issue still today. It has never been in France. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that our con my country is not a racist country. I'm just saying that the way we leave cultural, racial differences uh, are different from uh, other countries. And what's new to us, and maybe the, the question for your Armenian friend, is that suddenly cultural, cultural differences become a problem where they have never been. And so we don't know how to deal uh, with that. Uh, um, and up until recent uh, times, the nation identity was strong enough to absorb everybody. And everybody felt, okay, and nobody would, would wonder, am I Armenian, am I French? People who are proud to be French. But now it's very different because all social relations are tensed and, co and con conflictual. Your, your, your comment reminds me of a, of a s statement uh, it, uh, by Ronald Reagan uh, when he said that, um, and this of course when he was still alive so he was able to say it, that, uh, uh, that he remembers the 1950s when there were no racial problems. Uh, and, uh, and, and there's a kind of tinge of that in what you're saying, Anne Cecile. I remember the first time seeing a Josephine Baker movie and I was quite shocked by the... Um, uh, by the racial stereotypes that were you know, true enough, it was the 1930s. But at least she could do it. That's true, but there were. What and and, and uh, France has the highest rate of uh, interracial mar marriages mm -hmm. in, in the entire Western world. That's that's a basic fact. Uh, we we have racism, but we we have a different way of uh, living together. Do they intermarry with Armenians? With? I'm <laughs> sorry, did I that? Can, can you do, translate? Do they intermarry with Armenians? Of course, uh, uh, of course. It, it has never been an issue in, in, in France. Uh, James, I no noticed you wanted to say something. Yeah, I, I wanted to pick up on a, a comparison you made, Harvey, that I think is really important, and certainly for, for us as Europeans trying to portray Europe to, to the United States, which is that people here are incredibly comfortable with espousing multiple national identities. Um, you know, I introduce myself to someone, and they say, oh, I'm British, and what does that mean? It means that they maybe had a great-grandparent that came over on a boat at some point. Um, but in the same breath, they'll tell you that they're German, and they'll tell you that they're Mexican, and they'll tell you that they're Salvadorian. People have this wonderful kind of cultural melange in their own head of where they're from. And perhaps it's because this is a, a comparatively young country, so all of these, um, you know, this, this miscegenation, if you like, is still comparatively fresh in people's minds. But I think it's great. I think the fact that people are able to espouse those multiple identities, and you know, the same families will have various different holidays and festivals in their own calendar relating to this grandparent or that grandparent or this branch of the country. It's really important, and it's really important to us as Europeans because you know, we, we forever have an eye on the, the demographic of this country that we're trying to engage with. Um, the phrase minority majority is always part of cultural conversations because we can't continue. If we want to engage with the kind of the future generations of leaders in this country, we can't continue to rely on the fact that most of the people at some point had an ancestor from Europe or something because firstly, they didn't. They come from all over the world. But secondly, because these individual cultural identities are becoming so blurred, 
the next generation of leaders aren't necessarily going to see themselves as being, oh, I'm Irish American. They're going to have that great big long laundry list of eight different nationalities in their minds, some of which may be European, some of which aren't. Um, I think that's wonderful, but I think it does pose us an interesting challenge in terms of how to engage. I'm, I'm wondering if uh, uh, one of the other issues, though, that sort of is related to that is, is the issue of religion. Uh, when you go to Europe, you discover that basically nine out of ten people do not attend church on, uh, on, on Sundays, that these are fairly secular societies uh, in the United States. Uh, it would be political death to announce you are an atheist. Uh, it, um, people are quite accustomed to, um, uh, to having religion as very much part of their everyday life. So I, I'm curious to know to what extent is, is, is does this play into the fact that perhaps sort of tensions with immigrants is, is, is coming in because, there are, because of the sort of different views of religion in Europe than we find in the US. Kimberly? Yes, so I think uh, immigration scholars uh, studying uh, both the US and, and Europe have noted that religion has often been um, a way in which a new immigrants to the United States become integrated into American culture. Whereas, by contrast, uh, in, especially in the contemporary period, uh, religion has really kind of had the opposite effect, I think, in Europe. And it's somewhat ironic because in the US, actually, sociologists who really study religious practice have uh, found that it has been not only declining in the US, but that people regularly lie in the US about how much they go to church. <laughs> so people's degree of observance is actually far less than the statistics would have you believe. But I think what's important there is that culturally, they feel it's important to represent themselves as religious. That's part of how we present ourselves often enough in this, in this country. And so for new immigrant groups coming, this becomes a way as also as, as, as if they are religious, they can join into uh, you know, local churches or their own churches or you know, mosques or whatever can potentially be more accepted um, given that that fits in a sense with the kind of cultural repertoire around them. Um, whereas I think in the European context, it seems like, as you say, especially in such a secularized context, that um, highly religious uh, individuals or groups are, are regarded with considerable suspicion these days. Do you know there is a, a special character to being secular or, or like? Uh, and that is, it reminds me of a person, someone who said that you can only be a special kind of atheist. You can be the atheist from the religion you just rejected. Uh, and so every religiosity still is in Paris as if we are socialized in France's earlier history. Uh, it brings that up. And so when laicite dominates the culture, and I think of, I remember being struck, as many of us may have been, by the two women who were on the beach, and they were, their heads were covered, and, and they had on a burqa or something like that, and they were, there was the image of them being forced to disrobe or by the police. That's in the American interpretation of it. And uh, most Americans couldn't understand how you could demand that they take off their clothes uh, as a kind of freedom of religion. I have to admit, uh, I encourage that policy. Well, no, you, no. <laughs> you didn't get any massive influence from the US trying to stop it. The, but the point here, here is that there is a religious issue even when you are not religious, if religion is tied to culture as we believe it is. That is to say these Muslims arriving, what political scientists refer to religiosity, where religion governs a range of behavior, threatens in a ostensibly non-religious way the culture because it threatens to impose standards that they are unprepared for or unwilling to accept for themselves. And there's an interesting French sociologist or, or, or historian, uh, Gérard Noriel, who argues that most antipathy towards immigrants comes from something people see in their culture in their past. And this culture and in this past, in the rural sticks of France, is this highly religious Catholicism that dominated and deformed the life. I want to throw out one word, and I'd like to see what, it, what, it, what occurs to the member of the panel, as uh, this is my experience in, uh, as an academic uh, on, a, on a discussion exam. Burkini, discuss. <laughs> Any thoughts about the, the, the symbolism, the role, the why was it a big deal? Uh, Kimberly? Yeah, that has been a big issue, certainly. Um, well, I guess it does bring us right into, again, culture. Uh, and um, I think it particularly sums up the way in which the conflicts over Islam in Europe have become fixated on uh, questions of gender. 
that uh, women's bodies have been part of one of the battlegrounds. Um, I think you know people studying colonialism would argue this is nothing new, that there were similar battlegrounds historically um, in, uh, in, in French colonies, for instance. But it does seem like uh, it, it, the headscarf and then now the burqa uh, seem to sum up for people in, in sort of one <laughs> piece of cloth what it is they object to uh, about the, the religious minority and the religion itself. That, um, so I mean, I think it, 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 it definitely has been a kind of focal point for the kind of opposition. But I, I would also add that I think um, opposing something like the burkini or the burqa is also a, a, in many ways a kind of more politically acceptable guise for criticism of immigrants. Um, because I think, you know, it, be, it becomes something that it's harder to sort of reject. It's harder to say, um, if someone is saying, well, there's this religion that oppresses women, and then one wants to defend the religion to do what it wants, well, do you defend that that religion oppresses women? I mean, it puts people in a bit of a bind to kind of explain <laughs> where they stand on these issues um, that are rather complex, in fact. But um, I think it's, in that way, a very successful political tactic uh, that puts those who want to try to defend values of diversity and pluralism and so on, it puts them kind of on the wrong foot as they try to figure out where to situate themselves in a, in a rather uh, difficult uh, debate. Other thoughts on, on that? James? I, I just want to echo that. I mean, to, to people that use the sort of, um, use diversity as a means to, to criticize. Um, you know, are you really defending the rights of women in a culture that you don't understand or are you just using that as an excuse to be racist? Um, Burkini's great. If it, you know, it, it, to me, it symbolizes the kind of, it's the melding of a couple of cultures. If someone wants to wear something so that they feel comfortable on a beach, then absolutely bring it on. Uh, yes, and Cecilia. Uh, Burkini is that it divides the left-wing movements. Some are in favor, some want to ban it. So it's not an easy question. And today in, in Africa, some governments um, uh, are banning Burka, Burkini, so, it, so it's, it's not easy, it's not a... And the problem that we are facing is that on the one side you, you have freedom of expression and the diversity of culture, and on the other side you have movements who, who use, that, that are using uh, Burkini and all that to provoke and make statements. So you have to, to keep cool and make, make the difference between uh, the two. Well, let me ask you, is this about cynical politics or is it about um, some broader social disaffection when, when you, you have, for instance, you had a number of uh, laws in France and Belgium banning the, the burqa, banning the hijab. Um, it's easy to understand it in terms of very cynical politics, especially the conservative parties worried about losing votes to their right. But is there a sort of deeper base that, 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 that this kind of manipulation is, is really playing with? Kimberly? I guess I do tend to see it as more about cynical politics, um, especially the burqa bans, because really how many people are wearing burqas in <laughs> Western European countries? I mean, really very small. We're talking about very small numbers of people. I think with the headscarf uh, issue in France, which is, uh, I think is more complicated and has more complicated roots. Um, but again, I, I think that conflict, which had started in the late 1980s around whether or not girls should be wear, able to wear the headscarf in schools, I think in the latter half of the 90s, the, the government had found a way to kind of mediate locally, to be pragmatic and find ways to kind of negotiate with families about how to deal with it. And then when Chilak uh, came into power, really decided to go after it and make an issue out of what wasn't really a big issue at that time. So I tend to see it as more cynical politics, uh, even as I would concede that in some cases there can be some, some, real, some real questions um, that these kinds of practices raise. Uh, Lorenzo? I used to, but I think I moved a little bit since uh, our American elections and I'll explain why. Well, I have, we have a number of students and uh, one in particular who became a professor and was active in Turkish politics, wore the hijab, wore the, the, the scarf and the whole outfit, but she wore three inch heels, stylish in color colorful and very elegant. Uh, and so I thought that maybe her success in Turkish politics had something to do with making it more culturally acceptable. And, and on the other hand, I'd done some research on mobility in France and noticed that the women in the public schools who wore the scarf or wore some other things did better in school than those who didn't from the same demographic. 
And so I thought it was cynical. But then I thought about something seemingly unrelated, which is this last election and the, what the populist vote. Most people don't realize that what we're calling populist vote, the Trump vote, a large percentage came from the middle class. It was not, as everybody, the media came to say, the average Trump voter is wealthier than the average American white voter. And, and I wonder. The average real American? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the average real American, yes. Uh, and, and I wonder why is it so misconceived in the media and why is it so. Uh, so problematic, and I thought about in terms of the immigration question, which seems to be one of the big attractions. And for Americans, without this stamped official identity where the economy is declining, those voters felt, not like the poor who had nothing to lose because they were already poor, those voters felt they were losing something to these companies going elsewhere. And so who am I if I am not middle class? And I think maybe for the rest of the world that come with immigrants and other situations, it isn't just that they feel threatened. It's just who am I if I am not? the country and the place and the rules and the regulations and the never going to church and going to church on Sunday if I'm not who I always was. And I think there's this search to retain, make America the same again kind of thing, make, um, uh, make France the same again. Make America white again, I think, <laughs> is the way people uh, interpreted the... Uh, economic. Yeah. But, well, let me ask you this. I mean, this, this weekend we had this um, amazing march uh, of women coming to Washington to protest. Um, the threats to women's women's rights that are, are currently occurring, and to me, what struck me as really interesting is how international the uh, the movement was. That there were movements in every major city in almost every major country in uh, in the world. Does this, does this tell us something about world culture? Does it tell us something about a global threat to women's rights? Does it is there um, does this help us understand uh, changes in kind of world culture in 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 some way? Um, I'm, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are. Kimberly? Well, first of all, I would say even though it was formally the, the Women's March, it was really a, also a march against many things, including Trump. So I do think the large numbers reflect the fact that it was a pretty capacious movement that was on display, and it wasn't, wasn't solely about women's issues, even though that was uh, really one focal point. But the other thing that struck me about it, and it's something that I try to impress upon my American, American students, especially when I beg them to vote, <laughs> because we, as many know, our voting rates in this country are, are less than exemplary, and I want them to remember that as such a powerful nation, we have a responsibility to make sure that we elect someone uh, who is going to be thoughtful about our place in the world and that the world watches what goes on in American elections because the world is so affected by who is elected. And my students have no sense of that um, and are often surprised to learn just how closely our elections are followed. And so I guess I interpreted the, the, the march, uh, the, the many marches around the world as in part a way in which people who were not happy with the outcome of the election because they fear it is going to affect their countries, neighboring countries, world politics, world prosperity, that they want to have a voice too, actually, and that they were getting up to demonstrate that as well. And I think, as you say, there were specific women's issues that were also at stake, but that it was a much broader uh, kind of mobilization uh, and an effort to convey discontent with what has happened in American politics and how that could really affect people around the world. Uh, James, I noticed you nodding. I'm curious if you have a European perspective on, the, uh, on, on sort of the impact of the Women's March. Well, I'm, I'm just nodding in agreement, really, and it's, it's not so much a commentary on the, the women's marches around the world, although that's, that's part of it, but it is a commentary on the fact that the world watches US politics in the way that the world doesn't really watch the politics of any other country. Um, yeah, I remember this from when I was a child, and I had a fascination with US politics during the sort of the, the Carter and Reagan eras. Um, there is a... Concern's not the right word, but there, there is certainly a... The rest of the world watches the politics of the US because of the effect it will have, whether it's on regional peace and security in the Middle East, whether it's on transatlantic trade, whether it's on the economy. Whoever wins elections here has a dramatic effect on how the rest of the world thinks, on the rest of the world's economy, on where people can live, where people can work, all of that sort of stuff. Sometimes it manifests itself in um, you know, events like we saw with the, the marches over the weekend. Sometimes it's as simple as, you know, we've seen European newspapers write open letters to US politicians and that sort of thing. Usually it goes horribly wrong because voters don't like being told what to do by foreigners and order politicians. Um, but you are in a unique situation here. And I, I say this partly as a diplomat because I'm, a, I'm an impartial observer in this country. But even if I were not, I think it's, it's an easy observation to make that you're in a unique situation here that the rest of the world watches your politics with bated breath because of the impact it has on absolutely everybody else. Um, let me uh, move on to a somewhat different 
aspect of these issues. Uh, a couple of years ago, Angela Merkel made a statement saying that multiculturalism has failed. Uh, I think one of the differences I noticed between the United States and Europe is that we are, I think, in many ways more comfortable with, with a multiculturalism, and, and for Europeans, they're not. Uh, is multiculturalism a solution or a problem, as far as, uh, as, far as you see it? Kimberly. <laughs> I actually don't think we're as comfortable with multiculturalism as we like to say we are, which is kind of one of my earlier points. Um, I mean, one of the interesting things about this election was how much Trump and uh, people around him emphasized the evils of political correctness, which to me was a throwback to the 1990s. I mean, I hadn't really thought about this until, you know, since that time when we had a lot of debates about multiculturalism and it was all wrapped up with political correctness, that when we're, you know, conscious of being a multicultural society, then we're careful about, uh, about what we say and the names we use to d describe each other, that we're respectful of differences and so on, that this was all packaged in terms of being, you know, politically correct and that this then shuts down discourse. And so to me, it was somewhat surprising to hear that in such uh, force throughout this campaign and that that was so resonant. Uh, when you look at what Trump voters said about why they wanted to vote for him, often they said, well, he says it like it really is. There's all this political correctness. We're not able to say what we really think. Um, and so it made me think that we're not as different <laughs> in this regard as we might like to think we are from uh, European societies where also there's been a, a suspicion of political correctness and multiculturalism. I think of the Netherlands as a place that used to call itself rather multicultural, but then out it went in the 2000s with the same kind of criticism of political correctness that we're hearing here. So I think we're less different in this regard. Uh, yeah, uh, Lorenzo and, Ansa, and then Ansa oh, I just think we're, we're very different uh, sectionally in terms of, I don't mean regionally, but I mean in terms of social behavior. Our multiculturalism stops at the political door. Uh, we are multicultural in every way one can be multicultural in the social level and in the cultural level as a large country. But that we've always managed to segment our politics in such a way as to not institutionalize structures that are multicultural. We have regulations that ob oblige expression, but it's, uh, the expression is in a social context. So we pray in a certain way in public and don't pray in a certain way in public, but that public is not a direct part of our politics. Well, I, I was just wondering um, about uh, political correctness and this debate about altern alternative facts. And, um, uh, I, and I was wondering, because we, we are talking about uh, culture and civilization, maybe one of the problems we are facing today that is that we, have, um, we don't know how to think anymore. I mean, the Enlightenment uh, philosophers, they taught us how to think. And make a and make difference between right and wrong, what is false and what is true, and there it is a, a method, method, a methodology. Oh, that's correct, methodology. methodology. Uh, thank you. And maybe we are losing this methodology, and that's why we don't make a difference between false, true, uh, what is right and what is wrong, because we we have no methodology to make the the difference. And um, our, so our societies are very, uh, we value emotions, that's very good, but we must value thinking and reasoning. People can't make the difference today because they don't know how to think anymore. Well, this may be the wrong way to segue uh, from, the, from that particular uh, 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 comment, but one of the advantages of being in Washington is very frequently the level of expertise in the audience is equal to the level of expertise on the panel. Uh, so what I'd like to do is to invite uh, members of the audience, if they have questions, ideas, or thoughts that they'd like to express, um, why don't we open it up to, to discussion? Yes, the gentleman with his hand up. Uh, I see with one eye, so it looks like I'm looking over your shoulder. Thank you. I'm Leon Weintraub, retired from the U.S. Diplomatic Service. I have a question for James Barber. You had spoken about uh, using media more effectively to press the advantages of diversity and immigration. I, I think some of the items you mentioned, such as differences in food and culture and dress, et cetera, these are what I would categorize as soft news, likely to be featured in the style section, in the food section, in the travel section, which you get one attack by a few people on an airport or in a restaurant, all that other stuff goes out the window. The other stuff, it's nice, it's, gee, I didn't know they ate this or they dressed like that, but it's not too salient 
in people's lives, but you get one attack by a small group, that's very salient. So I, I really don't know how much, how much the media can really effectively do. I think I agree with most of what you said. I mean, yes, the, the media will always report a terrorist attack on an airport. They will always report the horrible that's happened before they report the nice stuff that ends up on the second from last page. Um, doesn't have to be like that. But I think also, and again, we, we heard that awful phrase, um, alternative facts just now, and fake news and whatever else. I, I'm not accusing the European media of going that far, but there is selective reporting. There are editorial stances. There are, you, know, you can find statistics to prove absolutely anything, but there has been reporting of issues around migration, for example, certainly in my own country, where I know in various other European countries, to do with you know, the, the paradox I mentioned of the immigrant that's taking social housing and benefits at the same time as taking your job. Um, you don't have to write that. You don't have to report it. And in most of, the, most of the cases, it's not true. So yes, I agree that the media need to sell newspapers or they need to sell subscriptions to their websites and ad clicks and whatever else. And most of the ways they have to do that at their disposal are through reporting bad news, because that's what people like to read. But you don't have to be scaremongering, and you don't have to have an editorial stance that whips up popular hysteria. You can be slightly more responsible than that. Other questions in the audience? Questions? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Could someone get in? Oh. Hi, my name is Michelle Lynch, um, and I work for Google here in Washington. Thanks for this really interesting uh, discussion. Um, Google's been investing a lot in promoting culture, and we created uh, a lab in 2011, actually in Paris, um, called the Cultural Institute, which is now an online presence where there's over six million um, pieces of art, documents such as Nelson Mandela's letters from prison, um, different artifacts and, and historical uh, documentations, and, and then we also do interactive exhibitions online, such as the Dublin Rising. Um, there was one on American democracy this year. So um, we really see this as a, a way for, for especially a younger generation to experience different cultures. Um, and then also with YouTube, we're seeing a whole new generation really leveraging um, the power of the internet to promote their culture. And we're seeing that most people who are watching YouTube videos are from outside the country from where it's created. So I guess my question is, um, what ideas do you have? How can technology help? Um, where does it hurt? And you know, where can companies like Google continue to support cultural exchange and understanding? Thoughts on the panel? I'm, I'm amazed since you brought up uh, American creativity and alternative facts. I, first of all, there's a long history of alternative facts in American history. Remember Nixon and that is no longer operative so that he could remove but I think that that's where uh, technology can be important, and I won't call it truth checking, but in assimil assimilating and understanding and pr providing diverse sources of news. When I'm out of the country, I look for diverse sources of news, but when I'm here, like most Americans, I take the most immediate source of news, and I don't. I took an Uber here and heard Fox News for the first time in my life. I was horrified. But the point is that I'm still part of the bias. I don't look beyond my preferred sources. So I think technology, because we all sit at our computers, can make that kind of news diversity accessible. Uh, Amazon recently started, no, it's, I think it's the Washington Post, but it comes on Amazon, something that assimilates parts of some newspapers. And I don't know if that could be a possibility. Uh, I'd, I'd like to put my two cents in, since this is actually an area where I do research. Uh, and um, one of the things that it strikes me, I, I work primarily on film and television uh, 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 and sort of the influence of the American media market. But one of the things that, that technology has been effective in helping other countries preserve their cultures is that uh, changes in technology now make it much, much cheaper to make a very professional movie uh, than it used to be. You can now do pretty much all the effects of the first Star Wars on a laptop computer now, which, uh, 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 which is a big change. It makes it possible for many countries, and if you look at uh, issues of culture, uh, um, you, know, if you, you have a convention in New uh, UNESCO which basically uh, wanted to preserve cultural diversity. Uh, one of the things that technology does is it makes it 
economically feasible to produce very professional audiovisual products uh, uh, from very small cultures from, uh, and still make them viable on a, on a market. Uh, things like also linear, something called linear editing and, and, and other stuff. Uh, also, there's things like narrow casting, right? That you're a small culture with a tiny, with a language. Um, you can use narrow casting, that is say, broadcasting from a website, uh, to provide kinds of products that there may not be enough people to justify a television channel or, uh, uh, or, or, or media. So technology can be positive. It, of course, can also be, uh, be negative. Um, when we talk about internet streaming, for instance, uh, when I interviewed uh, someone who's head of uh, Screen Australia at the time, and, and I was basically trying to say, well, isn't this a sort of nice way to, you know, you can now distribute your films? And he says, Internet streaming is just another way to distribute American product. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's a double-edged sword, sword, I think, but it's useful to look at, at both sides of, of that fence. Other thoughts on that issue? Uh, uh, Google, Amazon, those firms sometimes are stronger than the states. So what are the consequences uh, of that when they don't want to pay taxes? When for some of them they uh, they have uh, you know medieval working conditions for people, what what kind of re regulations can we have for those co companies? I'm asking the other panelists. Well, aren't we reassured because Google says first don't be evil, which is something where the current administration may not qualify. Uh, that uh, uh, so I mean, is there a qualitative difference between companies being powerful and countries being powerful? And this is. It's slightly picking up on the regulatory question, but also, Michelle, in, in direct response to your question, what can you do? Um, technology is such a wonderful enabler in terms of access to culture, access to cultural knowledge, access for people like me to audiences that we might not otherwise have. And whether it's you know, the digitization pro program at the Library of Congress or whether it's the Europeano program on the other side of the Atlantic, technology is wonderful in enabling that. To answer your question, what can you do? Fight like hell for net neutrality because it's so important. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. A microphone's coming. Hi, my name is also Michelle. Um, my question is slightly related to the technology question, but I just wanted the opinion from the panel about the ideas of all of these movements being, and people's anger and dissatisfaction being pushed by relative disparity, not absolute deprivation. So. We're acknowledging that the Trump voter wasn't the poorest of the poor in America. And I think that there is possibly a role of being able to see people all around the world so easily at different stages of wealth, but the pre predominant thing that you see are these high levels of wealth. And as the world becomes more and more unequal, you see people who have things you don't have, whether it's financial, or it's educational opportunity, or health, yeah. or clothes. And a lot of popular culture you know, emphasizes and promotes this. We see real housewives, we see celebrities. You know, I grew up with lifestyles of the rich and famous, and champagne wishes and caviar dreams. And now, that type of media and that type of everyday person's experience is accessible to everyone through technology. And I wonder if that is, or if anybody on the panel thinks that that has a role, or if it contributes to people's anger over not having access to something that they think is, they justly should. Thoughts on the panel? Uh, I guess I want to add a small point, and, and which is similar to the point you're making. Uh, when I was in graduate school, there used to be a literature on something called the revolution of rising expectations. Uh, and, and the thought was, you don't get revolutions because you have wide disparities between the poor and, uh, and the rich. You get revolutions when the poor think they should be richer. Uh, and, uh, and that, to some extent, there is at least some, uh, some information that supports that, uh, that notion. No, I, I, I just think that one might not have been working, but I, you don't need what I just said, except I agree with you. Rev historically, all revolutions tend to occur in populations that are disappointed in their upward mobility, that is resulting from some immediate past change. 
revolutions tend to occur when people are getting slightly better off, too. Um, yes, gentleman in the gray suit, yeah. Hello, my name is John Young, and I was a beneficiary of a transatlantic exchange program, the Congress Bundestag Youth Exchange Program, and I know my experience being foreign in a new place and trying to have, well, figure that out has given me so much empathy for folks who, I guess, are trying to do the same, either resettling or trying to make, a, I guess, new opportunities for themselves. I um, wanted to know what your thoughts are on similar exchange programs for transatlantic exchange and, I guess, building broader cultural competencies and fostering stronger connections between various communities. That, that gives me a wonderful opportunity to trot out my current hobby horse, which is the, the Marshall Plan, um, which for those that haven't heard me speak over the last week or so, this is the 70th anniversary of the Marshall Plan. Um, there's an operative point here, which is Marshall Scholarships, which are one of the, the most, to my mind, successful and productive schemes of their, of their kind. But there are so many others, um, Fulbright, Schumann, and so on. It's absolutely invaluable. We run various cultural exchange programs, um, study tours to Brussels, that kind of thing here at the delegation, they are always tremendously oversubscribed and they are always tremendously helpful. And what we find is that there are people like yourself that come back from these things with a, not necessarily markedly changed, but certainly with a slightly changed outlook on life, with a slightly new perspective on the world. And those are, you know, those are the people that we want to be friends of Europe in the United States for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Those are the people that if you you embark on these kind of transatlantic cultural education exchanges, whether it's an entire year studying abroad or whether it's two weeks that we send you off to Brussels for an intensive study tour, you then hopefully will be um, a friend of the transatlantic relationship for life, and that's why it's invaluable. I thought it was quite interesting that one of the reasons that many of my friend, younger friends in Britain were so concerned about Brexit was the membership in the Erasmus program, that, um, which is the, a program that permits Europeans to visit other European countries for a, a year of, uh, of, of uni university matriculation. Uh, personally, I was absolutely changed by doing it. I was in the Sweetbriar junior year abroad uh, as a young belle of the South, uh, that, um, uh, and I had a, such a a wonderful time uh, living in France that I kept looking for excuses to go back, uh, ended up enrolling at Sciences Po, uh, the French Political Science Institute, kept then chose when I went for my PhD because I didn't want to work for a living. Uh, I, um, uh, I did a topic of uh, research that would allow me to go back to France, and, and I woke up one day and discovered I was uh, an, an expert on France. So uh, that, uh, and this is having started my university as a physics major, but, um, but in any event, I, I, I certainly endorse your, your thoughts about the importance of, uh, of exchanges. Questions, other questions from the audience? Yes, lady in the white jacket. So I guess, Bouncing off of that, I'm also a student at the Elliott School. I'm a graduate student, and later this semester, I'll be studying abroad in Berlin. And I've been abroad, I was abroad in 2015, and even then, people were asking me as an American about the 500 candidates that were running for president. So I guess my question now that the election has occurred um, and everyone is still watching so closely is do you have any advice for me as how to? like field those questions as like the token American knowing everything about our politics and what we're thinking when I go abroad. I'll use Lorenzo's because we know his is working. So uh, I, was in, um, I was in Europe in 2008, right after the Obama election. And boy, was that a great time to be an American in Europe. I mean, everybody was telling me that the US was the greatest country on the earth, and the future was bright, and why can't we in Europe be as advanced as you people in the United States? It was amazing. So I think, yes, tides have definitely turned. Um, yeah, I think I would just suggest arming yourself with as much information as you can, because I do think in these conversations there's often people bring a lot of preconceived ideas to them, and if you can kind of penetrate the um, myths that people have about the United States. Um, I mean, certainly I do think the... I appreciated the fact that the Women's March was right after the election in the sense that it showed that the United States is not just Trump land, but it is, is a very divided country, as, as uh, you were saying earlier. Um, and that explaining the United States to other people is actually really a very 
complex and protracted enterprise because people, maybe they've been to one city in the U.S. or a couple of cities in the U.S., but then they've missed a huge swath of the country that um, is, could be, and, and is entirely different from the places that they've been to. So I think preparing yourself to try to really uh, penetrate the myths that people bring to the conversation and, and give them a more complex understanding of what people are like, how different different parts of the country are, um, I think that is what you might think about before you go. But certainly it's going to be interesting. <laughs> uh, I wanted to make a look. Since I was talking in France or in Grenoble uh, just at the end of October, just before this past election, I found that the most important approach was to say, first of all, I'm innocent. Uh, <laughs> uh, and secondly, that since Europeans pay much more attention to American lessons, elections listen to what they have to say because it's often instructive about the sentiments and the impacts they have and then you can respond. I was in France, in Paris, right, and right after the, on the day of inauguration of Obama in 2009 and I felt like a celebrity. I mean, people just <laughs> threw, right? I was just, out TV stations, everything, but you know, I think that the good part about that European continent and even the concern is that you can give the non-alternative facts and listen to their perceptions, which are often instructive. Uh, I, I wanted to, this is working it differentially, uh, I, I wanted to add a somewhat more somber note. Um, I think there's a real asymmetry between the extent to which Europeans know something about the United States versus the extent to which Americans know much about, about Europe. I think Europeans generally are much better informed about what goes on in the U.S. than, uh, than, than Americans are of, uh, of pretty much any European country. Um, that, uh, and I think this is partially due to the Internet but, and partially due to um, the, the America's dominance in popular culture in film and television where people, although you do get some negative effects, uh, one of the things I found out when I was doing uh, research is I ran into German law students who criticized their professor for not teaching them how to address a jury not knowing that they don't have juries in Germany. Uh, that, uh, and you have these sort of instances where people in Europe know more about the United States than they do uh, about their own countries, and that can be a somewhat negative uh, side of that asymmetry of, of information. Other questions? Yes. I just wanted to address this, this last issue by looking at the media presence here in Washington compared to the American media presence overseas. I mean, wh what you read is a, is a function of the journalists and the reporters that are there to make news of what is happening. That's why, for example, you look at a small country like Israel, can you imagine the amount of media presence there? That's why th there's a lot of news about that compared to the, the, the media presence in other smaller countries, it's just not there. So part of this, uh, the fact that we know less about European countries than, than they know about us is this, we just don't get that type of reporting available to us on a daily basis. I mean, it's available if you want to look for it, but it's not there every day in your face. Other, other questions? Yes, I'm sorry. Can I, just, can I just expand on that a little bit? Because we've talked a lot about the need to examine and understand the cultural differences and diversities within our own societies. They used to, I sound like I'm saying back in the day, but back in the day, you had organizations like USA Today that had bureaus dotted across the US, so did the New York Times, so did the Washington Post. They don't anymore. They're all coastal, if you're lucky, and that's it. So I agree with you entirely about the closure of overseas bureaus is, um, is tragic in so many ways, and the, the death of the traditional foreign correspondent is, um, is very sad. But I also think that, and this is not just about the United States, it's about various other countries and it's about Europe as a whole, is that we don't report on ourselves enough. Um, if you look at the, the pre-election coverage in this country, there were journalists traveling to parts of the country that they admittedly said they'd never been there before, and they were wide-eyed and looking around the place. This was their own country, but they were traveling to parts of it where the sheer cultural diversity and cultural differences were hitting them in the face. Other questions in the in the audience? Yes, the gentleman in the red tie. Uh, how do you think that the uh, globalization of scientific and cultural nexuses have advanced throughout uh, the last few years, 
and have led to snowballing effects throughout, uh, like you've said, uh, alternative facts <laughs> and uh, intense polarization throughout different opinions. Uh, and if you do think that uh, there is a partial globalization of culture due to the advent of new scientific advancements, would you say that uh, the polarization and ignorance would continue and hence get worse? Any thoughts? I would say, as, as a professor in a, in a, in a university, I, uh, I can only applaud ignorance because it gives me a job. Uh, so, uh, so I consider that an optimistic question uh, in, uh, in some ways. But I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced, personally, that, that people are getting more ignorant I, uh, uh, on either side. Do uh, other members of the panel have a...? No, well, I don't believe that people are getting more ignorant. But as I said earlier, they don't know how to tell the difference between what is right and what is wrong, what is true or false, because we, have, uh, we, we don't learn how to think anymore. And the, the, we put on the same level what an, an emotion, an opinion, uh, a, a scientific research, and, and that, that, that's, uh, that's wrong because we don't know how to, to tell the difference between things. And so we are facing a, a crisis in civilization. And that's why these kind of panels and meetings are so important because we need to come together and discuss and find a way to, to bring back some methods, some, uh, some way of, uh, of telling the difference between uh, false and, uh, and true. You know, I think that you can have globalization of cultural products more than you can have globalization of culture itself, since culture is interactively or dialectically experiential. That sounds kind of weird, but it, that it goes on and evolves. And so, uh, and to this point earlier about knowing has to do with, the, we see something American on TV, and you get, and it's rationalized, I mean, you see the product, it looks rational, but it, you only see it's rationalized in the sense that it, it's a set of rules and a set of behaviors. So the American president is elected by these open elections, and then we have this inexplicable thing called elect, an electoral college. Some of this is, much of it is has historically rational, but it's rationalistic to assume that it works well and it works perfectly. Yeah, and so you, the access to information mm -hmm. creates the assumption that the product has a root like the root you experience, which is often deceptive. Um, since we're coming close to uh, time, I would like to ask any uh, members of the panel if they have a final word they'd like to, uh, to throw out. Not throw out as in get rid of, but <laughs> but rather to <laughs> present you with uh, any any final thoughts that we should we should consider after after now that we know thanks to Anne Cecile that we're in a crisis of civilization, which is I'm not sure the best note to end on, but uh, uh, that uh, um, but uh, but let me uh, uh, then ask uh, anybody else want to have a, a final word? So I think this is part of a long process of people in different countries coming together about social problems in a way that we haven't before in other places, as well as in other places, as well as here, the proximity of interest and overlapping experiences will hopefully bring us closer together to analyze them in a variety of academic and non-academic circumstances. So we can thank Lorenzo for the symphonic music that allows us to close. <laughs> uh, that um, uh, let me thank everybody for uh, for your uh, for your attention, and let me remind you that we will um, uh, reconvene here at 3:35 for the next panel, which is the EU and the U uh, and the U.S. the partnership on the world stage. Uh, so uh, in between then and now, I invite you to uh, have coffee and uh, and and relax. Uh, and thank you very much for your participation. Thank you.